What happened to like calling it quits? And, like... I don't know. I'd like, I was getting real, I was really getting burned out on it. It was like not fun at all. And like the last couple of books I did, when I was, did the, I did like yearly books and like those just didn't work well because I don't know, there's like kind of this rhythm you get to reading it, like kind of like trance inducing and you have to have a lot of, a lot of comics to be able to really pull that off. Mm -hmm. And one year just doesn't cut it. And so those last three one-year books like didn't perform very well, and I was just kind of burned out on it and whatever. And, uh, just kind of decided to quit. I was like, oh, you know, 10 years is a good even place to quit, whatever. And then January 1st of 2011, I was like, you know, not going to draw a comic. And I was like, oh, shit, okay. And then you just did. I just, like, couldn't not do it, you know? And so I realized that, like, it's actually, you know, like, to come up, to, to figure this out that I could draw these comics and whatever and like stick with it as long as I have, I might as well just, you know, finish it up, you know? Yeah. So. Is that fun? That was my, I got a text message. In the year 2000, I only did it for half that year and it was spotty, like I missed days and stuff and it was like, it wasn't until like New Year's of 2001 that I'm like, I'm gonna do this every single day and never miss a day. And like, yeah. You know. At first, the comics were even supposed to be more about the house, like, you know, like, the adventures of the guys living in the snake pit and partying all the time and you yeah. know, whatever, but it just, it, it ended up, you know, since I ended up, we got kicked out like, you know, that month or whatever, it's like, it just kind of went on to be more about me. and like, We didn't even get kicked out, we just bailed. I guess so, yeah. Oh, dudes, Tony, Ben, what's up? Hey, what's up, man? You guys know what this is? Check this out. What is that? How's that shit, man? Why was it called the snake pit? Uh, who, is, who is responsible? For Bill, that? Tattoo Bill named it. Right. And he uh, he made that sign. He made this like a cardboard. I sign. still have it somewhere in this closet. Like the I cardboard still have that one. Sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like taped it up over the door, you know. And it just kind of stuck. And like it, when when I moved here, you know, it was like something to kind of like remind me of my roots or what. You know what I mean? Just yeah. it was it was like it was, and it sounds cool. You know, yeah, it was a cool the, sound. Why I changed the title? Like yeah, yeah. The, I feel like those. PCP roadblock guys were around. I don't know if any of them lived there. They must have. Yeah, Andy lived there for a long time, and and Charlie lived there too, and I think Mike even lived there for a little while. But yeah, like it was just kind of you know the hangout. They were just kind of coming. Yeah, around. yeah. I can't. I have a tape still of them at the that they left around that house with the VCU talent show that you played also with. Uh, the Ultimate Dragons. No shit. Said that. And it was like, obviously they were like trying to film PCP Robot. Right, right. all up on stage. But then at the end of the tape, there's like, I don't know how much of it, but. Wow. Do you still have that? Yeah, yeah. Man. You gotta hook me up. I will. I will be on, it will probably be a cutaway. Oh, cool. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Trivin and JD were both in the Elder Dragons. And there's JD the sword? The sword, guy? yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Trevor was in that. Trevor was in the sword, and I think he, he uh, quit. That's it. Like, I was actually in the sword for the first show. Oh! And then they kicked me out. Oh. I didn't really talk to those guys ever again. <laughs> what? Any, re any reason that you know? Uh, like, they said that my gear wasn't up to par, <laughs> and. I don't know, like, they're really, they're, I had a problem with Trivet, I think, from the beginning, because of the, he had pulled some shit with the Ultimate Dragons, you know, like, yes, a few a, times, like, quit the band right before a tour, or, like, not showed up to a show, or bailed yeah. on this or that, and so I just kind of didn't trust him anyway, uh -huh. and 
JD was putting the sword together here, and I was going to play bass, and he was looking for a drummer, and then Trivet happened to move here, and he's like, oh, let's do that, and I was like kind of not into that, because I really didn't trust Trivet, I still kind of don't, and I guess JD just made that executive decision that like, like yeah, he's, make it. he's more valuable to the band <laughs> than I was, so, <laughs> aside from the sword. Sorry. <laughs> uh, not really, not. J Church... I, I, you know, I've never not had to, I've never been able to not have a job, you know, like J Church did a little bit and we got to tour Europe and Japan and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, we didn't make money really, but that's not why I do it. Yeah, you do it for the love. How many <laughs> yeah. bands have you been in, do you think? Oh, well, they, that, they come and go. No idea. I tried to make a list once. I think actually like somewhere on my Facebook, I made a list and it was maybe a hundred like it was a lot like you know Thank counting you. like you know it had to be a band that like practiced and actually played a show no j church was from san francisco uh, it was that guy lance's right like, he lance. was he ran the whole show you know and his uh his girlfriend transferred to school here so he moved out here with her uh -huh. and ended up getting a job at sound exchange the record store where i was working and you know, I knew I knew of J Church at the time, and I'm like, wow, the guy from J Church. You were a big the fan, so, right. yeah, totally. And we just hit it off, became friends, and he started talking about wanting to put a band together here, like you know, just continue it. And I helped him. You know, we found all the players and stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. I got a guitar when I was 14. Um, yeah, my dad, <laughs> this is a funny story. My dad said that it, like uh, we had interim report cards that like weren't your actual, this was like middle school or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't these, it wasn't your actual report card, it was your interim report card where like the teacher would just fill it out in class that day and it was just handwritten in like carbon paper. My dad said if I got all A's and B's on my interim, he'd buy me a guitar. And I got Nut straight F's. I totally like failed every class. <laughs> and it's the end of the day and I was just like I went to the office and I was like, Oh, I dropped my interim in a puddle. Can I have another one so that I can uh like go get my teachers to fill in my grades? And I'm like, sure. And they just gave me a blank one and I just filled it out. Oh and wow. Play, was playing my new guitar that Scam night. <laughs> Scammed your way to your first guitar. Yep, yep. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Well, I really I wanted to play bass because I thought that Dave Blood from the Dead Milkman was real cool. Like he had that like dangly earring. I thought uh -huh. it was really cool. And I don't you know I and I asked my dad for a bass first, and he was like, "You just want to play the bass because it's the easiest one. You have to get a guitar and learn that first. And so I did, and then he got me a bass later. But yeah, I always wanted to be a bass player, like specifically, and like the Dead Milkman were a huge reason for that. Do you think being like being known for Snake Pit helps sort of with the music gain oh, interest in bands that absolutely, you're in. Absolutely, definitely, definitely, for sure. And anytime I go on tour, I take Snake Pit books with me and sell them at the merch table. And like, well, those will sell better than the records <laughs> and stuff. I think a lot of a lot of times people will come and see my band just because it's like, right. yes, I got Snake Pit's band or whatever. Yeah. <laughs>
I still love playing music and stuff, but I've kind of accepted that, you know, I'm not going to be a rock star. You know, yeah. I'm not going to get to the point where I want to, where I can pay rent playing in a band, <laughs> which is not going to happen. And, you know, I, I've kind of resigned it more to like hobby status and, you know, my, my job now, I, I don't get much time off work. I can't really go on tour like I used to and stuff. And that's okay. It's, you know. I'm almost 40. You know? It's like, hard, man. It's when you're so that hard. old, like, you feel stupid at some house show with a bunch of 22-year-olds, and I'm like, who's that creepy old guy in the corner? And like, don't mind me. I'm just going to sleep in a sleeping bag on this floor later tonight. Ghost Knife is just fun playing with my friends, and Mike has these crazy connections. So, like, you know, we have a song that's gonna, that was on Teen Mom on right. TV, like, that this past week. Like, just from Mike's crazy connections that he has. Found you know, a way. to pull it off. Yeah. yeah. All right, now the time is in the set when I'm happy to announce a big thing that just happened for Ghost Knife. It just happened a couple nights ago. Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday, Tuesday night. night. watching MTV on Tuesday night. Our little band, our, our little, little Teen our Mom little, had a new episode that night. There's a little show called Teen Mom. Our little engine that could band had a song on MTV Teen Mom! Seven Inch, that, that record has a theme. Like one song is about me having a kidney stone. And one song is about Lance who died of kidney failure. And it's, you know, it's like, I felt like it was kind of this unifying theme of the record. When uh, Lance died and his girlfriend decided to move back to San Francisco. And right before she left, she called me and she's like, hey, I have Lance's amp and I can't get it back to San Francisco. So she sold it to me. Dude obscenely low price and I just you know I had this Marshall stack in my house I'm like I gotta do something with it you know so I started writing some songs and put together uh, the band Shanghai River right which was just me and like two people I knew that was like real simple songs that like you know the whole idea was to just be this real basic like just one chord whatever and did that and it was fun and you know we did a tour and put out a record and stuff and then after that, that band kind of dissolved, and then I just had some more songs left over from that that we put together with Shit Creek. Yeah, I did have a kidney stone last summer, yes. And it was brutal, it sucked. And it was, man, it... <laughs> Here's the story. I get, I was like peeing blood for like weeks and weeks, and so I go to the doctor. They send me to the urologist, the urologist like x-rays me or whatever, and he's like, okay, yeah, you have a kidney stone. We need to get it removed like right away. He's like, this was like in the morning. He's like, so you're gonna go like today to surgery and they're gonna put you under and zap it with this like sonic wave that breaks it up. And I'm like, okay. So I get in the car and I'm driving from the doctor's office to the hospital and in this drive, the phone rings and uh, it's the nurse and she's like, oh, you know, we found out that your insurance doesn't cover that procedure. So um, you're gonna have to get this other thing on Saturday. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, fine, whatever. And then I go home and read it up and like, the other, like basically the money, the, my insurance didn't pay for the sonic easy machine and then just pee it out and it's no big deal. Okay. Instead they had to take a claw and go up my wiener and pull it out. You know like those like, those long claws with the little plunger like on Yeah, yeah, I'll it's basically there. one of those that they stick up my wiener and pull it out and like it's totally primitive and more expensive than the other thing or whatever and it's like totally retarded that our that the, my insurance, like I have Ham, the uh, Health uh -huh. Plans for Awesome Musician, which is a cool thing, but it's just, you know, it's like it really basic. Like doesn't go that far. Right. And it was just so ridiculous, like that morning when I was getting the surgery, like they actually wheeled me by the machine that would have done the thing, like it's just empty, just sitting there, and they like wheeled <laughs> me by it to like, you know, like, you know it's uh, actually, a, a, this is a theme I'm, I'm going to talk about in the new book. Is that like you know like in the early night in the early OOS when I was doing it, and there wasn't like social media, there wasn't Facebook and right. MySpace and stuff. Like I was like the idea of like sh just sharing like whatever like bullshit you did that day. Like that wasn't like nobody really did that, you know. It was like wow, you know, you're so brave like sharing your whole life and like whatever, who cares? But then like you know, 
everyone starts getting MySpace and Facebook and stuff, and it's like everyone's like, you know, today I went to work and I <laughs> ate a pizza and then watched TV with my girlfriend. Yeah. You know, like everyone's doing that now, and like it's gotten to the and and the way that it's evolved, it's gotten to the point where like everyone is like super careful about what they say on there now because like you know you can say like. I'm having breakfast and it's delicious. I love eggs. And then someone's like, eggs are cruel. Or right. someone else, like, I can't believe you're supporting the factory farming industry. Like, like, you know, that's an example of like how the, the littlest thing that you say that you don't even intend to like offend or, or hurt anyone's feelings, like, yeah. it can be taken the wrong way. And like, people are so watch what they say now because like of the instant like backlash that is possible. And the thing about my comics is it's never been like that. I draw them and like maybe a year or two later somebody reads it, you know? And so it's, that's liberating in that like I can still be as free as I want in the yeah. comics, you know? It's because maybe it'll come back to me in a couple of years, but by then who cares? Uh, not, not so much anymore, but it's, you know, some, some things in the comic have gotten me in trouble. When you were a little more reckless and wild. Yeah, yeah, when in I was more reckless and wild, yes. <laughs> Cause it did. It was more like you. You're insane, and you party, and you go big. And yeah, yeah. That was. And then it's like there's a, a slow change. Right? It mellows out. The new book's like, like the boringest one. Right? <laughs> but seriously, it's like every night I just went to work and then came home, ate dinner, and fell asleep at ten. But yeah. it's like really boring now. But it's that's you know I'm not for a while there when I was first doing it I really was like kind of living in order to make good comics, like making stupid decisions and doing stupid stuff really? because it would make a cool comic. But, you know, now that I'm, like, I don't give a shit, like, I just do my thing, you know? Mm -hmm. I do what I do and, like, write the comic about it, and if it's interesting, cool. If it's not interesting, I don't care. I'm just going to do it, you know? I was, in high school, I was the president of the art club, and I drew all the time. I was always drawing comics and okay. doodles and stuff, always. And that is what, what made me decide to go to art school. And then being in art school, it was so, like, I hated it, you know, just being told what to do, every, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's it's not just, like, draw something you feel like drawing, it's, like, you know, make this by these dimensions, and it has to use this media, and whatever, and, like, I understand that's the point of art school, but it just made me not want to do it anymore. Yeah. And I dropped out, and I didn't do any drawing for a, for a long time. I dropped out of school in 95, and it wasn't until, like, 2000 that I really started trying to start drawing again. You've improved because of the comic, right? I mean, like yeah. Oh, definitely. You can see it. You can mm -hmm. look through the early books and see my skill level improve. But I do think, like, maybe two years ago, I kind of hit a plateau, and like, I don't think I've gotten any better. <laughs> <laughs> Jim's yeah. journal was uh, that's the comic that inspired me to do the snake. Pit. Right. Okay. Was uh, it's. What was like he only did one panel or something in a day? No, he did th he did four panels a day. I think. Oh, uh, okay. And um. It ran in the Onion for years, and like I think one of the editors of the Onion happened to draw it, like, and I, like he would have little books, like you know you go into like the bookstore or the comic section, they have a Garfield and Kathy and Dilbert books, mm -hmm. and they, one day I'm just like looking and I see this thing and it's like Jim's Journal by Jim, and I pulled it out and stood there in the bookstore, read the whole thing right there in the bookstore, like whoa, and it did that trance thing where you just right. like, and it's exactly it's like today I went to work and then I. Came home and fed my cat and what and that was it, you know. And I like it kind of blew my mind. Like, wow, this isn't funny and it doesn't have a point or any. It's just there, and, and like you take the whole the thing in and it's yeah. And I, I was really really into it and really inspired. And um, it was actually you know living over at the Snake Pit with uh, with Alex. Alex was like the first friend I had that had a computer, <laughs> and like you know we had dial up internet. You know, yeah, and sometimes right. like once in a while he would let me go on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you know that was like a big deal, and. Uh, I, I, I got on the internet one day and I was like, oh, I want to look up Jim's journal. I want to see if that guy's still doing it, what's going on with it. And uh, look it up and I realized, I found out that it was fictional. That oh. like, Oh, really? Yeah, like the, his name wasn't Jim and he didn't really have that job and those people were all made up. And that's, that's when I had that epiphany. I was like, whoa, you know what? I'm going to do that but do it for real and actually put my real life in there. I